sell my books and whatever you make with them, that's my donation. And uh, so you supported not only me, you also supported uh, the Contribution Museum in Columbus. Oh, where wow. I will actually speak. Uh, I will speak there next week uh, for the centennial of Contribuous Raid of Columbus. And that really brings me to Felix Sommerfeld. Um, uh, he was uh, very instrumental in making Contrabia attack uh, Columbus, New Mexico. It's always been a riddle exactly what motivated Contrabia, and um, this was also something that fascinated me. Like Ricardo said, the um, uh, Friedrich Katz, um, Michael Meyer, many historians that wrote about the Mexican Revolution mentioned Felix Sommerfeld, also mentioned that he could have done something that is not quite correct. And, uh, as it turns out, he was a naval intelligence agent uh, employed by the German Empire. Um, he came to Mexico in particular to embed himself with Francisco Madero, who was suspected to be um, successful in his uh, um, challenge to Porfirio Diaz's uh, dictatorship, which he ended up being. And um, so nobody has ever really found out how some of them did it. And so this is, uh, what I wrote about, I wrote two books about uh, Felix Sommerfeld um, in plain sight. It's about um, his biography up to 1914, up to the summer of 1914, um, the outbreak of uh, World War One. And the second book is about his role in during World War One, where he was in charge of the German strategy towards Mexico. And uh, one of the projects that he had was uh, getting Contrabia to create a war between Mexico. Um, Ricardo was mentioning um, some um, ideas about sources, so this is actually my love. I'm not a professor, I'm, I'm a researcher. Um, I have two master's degrees, I don't have a PhD. And um, my friends Harris and Sandler tell me you're lucky. <laughs> I'm self-financed, um, but uh, I love primary research. And I was able to find very interesting sources um, in my quest. Um, sources that nobody had seen before. So I discovered, um, for example, the financial records of the German embassy during World War I, all the Albert papers. Um, maybe some of you can remember there's a story where this German commercial agent lost his briefcase in the L in New York. Um, it was stolen by an American uh, Secret Service agent. And the contents of this uh, briefcase were um, displayed in the New York world four weeks later. It was a huge scandal. Uh, in that briefcase were records of checks that Albert had written to German sabotage agents that were blowing up factories in this country. It was a big, big scandal. And um, so, being curious, I went to the National Archives uh, 25 years ago, and I asked the archivists there if they know where this, the contents of this briefcase might be. And, um, you know, we looked and looked and looked. Nobody found anything. And finally, some archivists said, oh yeah, Albert Papers, I've seen them. And this was before the new archives were built in Maryland. It was in downtown. Um, so you, you know, the walls are only six feet high and uh, no windows, nothing. And so all the archivists are very, very pale. And uh, so we, we walk through there and he opens this iron gate. And in there is a shelf with 68 boxes full of documents. And says, these are the Albert Papers. I thought, this cannot be. Uh, it's just a briefcase. I don't know. That's what it is. Um, so I started analyzing these papers, and they were the financial records of the German embassy that everybody had thought had burned in a aerial attack on Berlin in 1945. Um, so this is just one example of sources nobody had seen before. And with these financial records, I went to the Benson Library here in Austin that has the financial records of Hansel that also most people don't know much about. But papers of Lazaro de la Garza, who was a uh, Diaz financial agent here in the United States. Um, the Benson Library acquired his papers when he died in Los Angeles in the 60s. And um, those are Contrabia's financial records. So I compared the German records with Contrabia records and of course correlated them and sure enough found a paper trail, money trail, that would lead me to what some of us were really doing and who paid uh, Follow the money. So my interest in Felix Sommerfeld started as a student at the University of Arizona. Uh, we just, I was just talking to Professor Cruz. I'm a graduate of the uh, University of Arizona, and my professor, Dr. Michael Meyer, who wrote about the Mexican Revolution, about America and so forth, Meyer gave me this folder, and it said, 
MID, Military Intelligence Division, Felix A. Sommerfeld. And he said, you know what, Harry, if you want to have a nice thesis, you research this man. If you find something out about him, that is a good thesis. So, 20 years later, I had written this book about Sommerfeld. Michael Meyer is the involved um, deceased. And um, so I'm thinking, you know, who could read this manuscript and give me some real good feedback? I, I admire the books by Harris and Sadler. And so I got the email of uh, Louis Sadler, Ray Sadler, and um, he immediately responded and said, come to the Las Cruces and we'll talk about something. And so I did. And um, so he says, well, Harry, I'm sitting there with Charles Harris and Louis Sadler. And Ray said, well, Harry, how did you how did you get interested in Sommerfeld? I said, well, Meyer gave me this folder and it said MIT record Sommerfeld. And he looked over to Charles Harris, he goes like, that bastard, we gave him that folder. <laughs> <laughs> so 20 years later, the folder came back to uh, Dr. Harris and Dr. Sadler uh, in, in, in the way of the book. Um, okay, so let's talk briefly about um, Sommerfeld's role um, in his life. Um, he was German, he came from the city of um, Schneidemühl, so if you look at um, Prussia in the 1870s, uh, the German Empire um, extended into Poland. Um, in fact, you might notice there is no Poland, right, on this map. <laughs> there was only Russia, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Germany. Poland was eliminated. And um, Sommerfeld came from this part up here. Schneidemühl is today in Poland, the city called Pila. And um, uh, so it was the frontier of East Prussia. And, um, uh, the German Empire was um, is giving Jewish citizens um, uh, opportunities in that part of Prussia, um, more political say than in other parts of Prussia. So the Sommerfeld family moved there in the 1830s already, and uh, Felix Sommerfeld was born in May 1878. Um, here are some uh, pictures of what the city looked like. So Schneidemühl, um, the railroads helped um, develop the, the, the place, uh, as well as this Kudo River. There's a river there. Um, the railroads were very important in Germany because, um, you know, getting materials to the coast, we have a very small coast, could only really happen um, if you had railroads. Um, the Sommerfeld family had a mill there, um, and uh, it's called the Borkendorfer Mühle. So you can see here, easy to work. Sommerfeld was his father. And, um, uh, so it's Little Felix grew up in this town uh, in a middle-class Jewish family, um, quite wealthy actually, um, they were well to do. And um, here's another picture of this river. I was reminded of uh, San Antonio um, when I thought about this because the Kudo River constantly flooded, including the downtown area of Schneidemühl. And um, I think when you look at the pictures of San Antonio, you have the same issue here um, with flooding. So he went to the so-called uh, gymnasium, so it's a high school. Um, he uh, graduated, and after his graduation, like any good Prussian, he had to go to the military. Because he was Jewish, he could not become an officer. Um, the Prussian military only allowed um, non-Jewish uh, citizens to become officers, so he um, uh, joined as a private and um, actually made it to Corporal um, when he was in the Boxer Rebellion. I don't know if many people know about the Boxer Rebellion. So in, yeah, Beijing. So in 1900, uh, Chinese um, rebels um, uh, concentrated on um, the legations, uh, uh, the embassies in, in Beijing. Um, and um, it was a standoff. Uh, and um, at one point, the German ambassador, um, who thought himself invincible, went out across the bridge, or had himself carried out across the bridge, and thought he would just go to the Empress and complain. Uh, he never made it, they killed him right there on the street. And uh, Emperor William was outraged, and so they raised uh, an army of um, 120,000 people. So we, you know, we, we underestimate how big the Boxer Rebellion really was, and that was just one of the armies that went there. The Russians, uh, the Americans, uh, the British, French, all came to fight the boxers, and Felix Sommerfeld was just had just joined the military, so he also was dispatched um, to um, China. Um, I 
have a quote. Um, I don't know if anybody had ever heard of um, the speech that uh, Kaiser Wilhelm gave um, as a farewell address to his soldiers in, in, um, in Bremen. Um, it was called the Hun speech. And so what he said was, um, when you confront the enemy, you will subdue him. No quarter will be given. No prisoners will be taken. Who falls into your hands will die by your hands. Just as a thousand years ago, the Huns under their King Attila made a name for themselves, one that still today makes them mighty in history. May the name of Germany be confirmed in such a way in China that never again a Chinese would even dare to look askance at a German. And um, you know what? I actually tracked down a ship on which Sommerfeld left. And he heard this speech. He was there listening to this speech, uh, which I found kind of interesting. Um, so Wilhelm was um, you know, known for his militarism and so forth. And, uh, so um, it was a brutal, brutal campaign. And it's something that's completely underestimated in historiography. Um, they killed thousands, tens of thousands of Chinese. Um, uh, there was a sentiment of anti-foreigners. Um, the missionaries there um, were uh, basically trying to convert Chinese to uh, Christian religion and um, thereby really injured the cultural heritage that uh, was there. So there was a lot of um, from groundswell of opposition to Westerners. And um, this was put down with brute force. Um, like I said, um, you see here the head groaning, mass executions. Um, here's the legation quarter. When they finally um, reconquered it, um, after months of, uh, or weeks of fighting, the British were the first ones there. Um, it was uh, in shambles, um, everything was destroyed. Um, but the people in the legations had actually survived, most of them. And um, you can see here what it looked like. It was an absolute crash. The reason why I studied the Boxer Rebellion and some of Hell's uh, role in the Boxer Rebellion, which was just a private, um, was that this was the beginning of a social revolution. Um, the Chinese, um, the Ch China did not calm down until 1949. So off and on you had these rebellions and they were put down and the government fell and the empress died and the next thing happened in 1949 was the communist revolution. And, um, and you have to think of this young man that came to, from Poland, from the, really from the boonies of, of uh, Germany, uh, came to China and saw this incredible violence and saw this incredible um, popular uprising that was put down. And uh, uh, there's a historian here in the Southwest, um, Jim Tuck, who said that Sommerfeld supported the Prussians against the Chinese. I don't think that's true at all. Um, I think it really impressed on that young man what, um, how brutal things can turn um, in a revolution. And when we later look at his support for Mexican revolutionaries, uh, he was not for revolution, he was for reform. He joined Madero he believed that Madero was able to somehow harness this, this popular anger into something that will be constructive rather than that destructive. Um, and I also found evidence later on that Sommerfeld, even though he served Pancho Villa, he was his main weapons buyer, um, he did not agree with a lot of the executions and violence that happened um, in, the, in this uh, time, 1950, um, So um, I would love to encourage historians to really study the Boxer Rebellion. There's not a single book or even article ever written about how the Boxer Rebellion would relate to the Mexican Revolution. And there's tons of very, very interesting parallels. So, 19, uh, so he comes back from the Boxer Rebellion. Um, he joins his father's business. In 1896, he takes a brief trip to the United States. He's we had two brothers that emigrated to the United States. One lived in New York, the other one in Chicago. And um, he, um, um, he went to see his, his um, older brother, Herman, in New York, who made him work in a, in a, um, ice cream, on an ice cream stand. And he was horribly abused, he said. Uh, so this didn't last very long. He went back to Germany. His brother worked in dad's mill then for this brother. Um, he came back again in 1898 for another trip. And um, what I could find out is that he probably dropped out of college and his father sent him to the U.S. to see what he can do there. Um, he joined the American military. So this was um, when the Spanish-American War was happening. And 
mean, there was a call for uh, joining the military to fight the Spanish. Sommerfeld signed up and um, uh, drove to Kansas for basic training. Um, obviously, the basic training he didn't like too much either because he deserted. <laughs> Stole $250 from his brother's landlord in New York and went back to Germany. So that didn't last very long either. <laughs> um, in 1902, he came to the United States again. Um, he was very lucky that uh, they did not have uh, any kind of central register for deserters because otherwise he would have been toast, right? But uh, nobody realized it. And, um, and in 1902, he also stayed only, um, only a year or so, went back to Germany. But something drew him to the United States. Um, he studied mining engineering. And um, so one of the things that he was interested in is um, not working in one of the very regimented German mines where you, know, you have very little chance of rising through the ranks. He <laughs> wanted to go to America and stake a claim and find gold and so forth. And, um, and so that's what he did. Um, and uh, 1908 is the next record that I have that he came to the United States, um, probably earlier, probably 1907. Um, he went to Chicago, from Chicago he went to Arizona, and um, he worked in a mine briefly, didn't like it, there were all these Cornishmen, he said. You know what Cornishmen are? Yeah, so they're English people from corn, from corn, in the Cornwall. And um, so he didn't like the Cornishmen, I guess it was a little rough. Jerome, Arizona was the uh, uh, prostitute capital of Arizona, I think. <laughs> and um, so he... Was that we get the word corn? Corn, maybe corn? Corn, yeah. Cornish, yeah. yeah. Um, so he went, uh, he got himself a, a mule and um, some digging equipment and he went into Mexico. And uh, so... Um, what was the year? 1907, or something like that. 1906, 1907. And um, so when he went to Mexico, just around that time were big strikes in the Cananea mines. Again, they were put down brutally. Um, so he did not join any of the big mines. He said he was just uh, looking for his luck. And, um, and uh, the inter interrogators in 1918, after he was arrested, had asked him, you know, how did you like it? He said, well, at least it was a healthy one. <laughs> so I didn't really find my goal. Um, but he went around the, the northern part of Mexico. Um, and um, uh, very interestingly, the question is, you know, who did he associate with? Um, so the reason why I know he wasn't very successful is I looked at all the mine registers and so forth. Um, he's never registered anywhere. He didn't own a claim. He was never a manager in a mine. He has heard Spanish? He spoke fluently Spanish. Okay. Yes. Okay. He spoke fluently Spanish. Where do you know that? Um, good question. Yeah. Probably on the road. Literally. Did you know, huh? Maybe the Spanish. No, no, because he never made it there. He was still on campus. I think, you know, I think that he learned it by just traveling through the southwest and then going into Mexico. How fluid it was, I don't know. When he later was working for Madero, it was by all accounts of this. It's absolutely fluid. There was a point that I wanted to ask you, that you mentioned earlier, how the Jews mm -hmm. not been able to be the members of the war mm -hmm. of the Russian army. Yeah. Uh, this was back, that was Napoleon had to make that change that after Napoleon consolidated the German state. Well, it was, there were some laws that were, you know, helping, for example, the Jewish, um, members of the Jewish community could not even become Prussian citizens. They could only get residency, but they could not become citizens. They were not allowed to vote. That changed in the 1880s. Um, it was still, shortly before World War I, a Jewish um, a member of the Jewish community could not become an officer in the German army. It changed in World War I when they knew what they needed more soldiers. But um, there was still discrimination in the army. Right? Now, if you converted to Christianity and you were Jewish background, no problem. You could become an officer. And, uh, you know, I looked hard to find whether Sommerfeld did that. Um, he never left any note about um, his religious beliefs, or I have no evidence that he ever went to a temple or to a church. So I really don't know. It, it could be the, the Prussian military records only have last names. So there's no Felix Sommerfeld, but there are a bunch of Sommerfelds. And uh, one of them is actually a Lieutenant Sommerfeld who was um, in 1906 in Berlin uh, registered in exactly the, the, the um, area where the German Secret Service School was, the military intelligence. And so it is totally possible that when he went back to Germany before he came to Mexico that he actually went through the Secret Service School there 
and then came back to America, and then he might have, if he was charged with going to Mexico, they might have thought he had, had, had back to the Yeah, absolutely, absolutely possible. Um, yeah, so he went um, through Mexico. Um, in 1908, um, he's registered in um, the consulate of um, Chihuahua as Mineur, you see here, Mineur, Maya, mm. Felix Hotel. Uh, so that's mm. the first record in Mexico that, that I could actually find of him. Um, and um, he was, um, you know, very friendly with the German community there, was a member of the uh, foreign club in Chihuahua City. Um, he met the Maderos, he said uh, on many occasions that he had known the Maderos long before the revolution. And um, he also met a, a very interesting character, also a mine and owner of mines in, uh, in Paral. His name was Frederico Starforth, also a German uh, um, family that went to Mexico in the 1860s. And Frederico, Frederico was the uh, same age like Felix. Um, later on, Frederico worked for Felix Sommerfeld came to the United States and is actually the man that wrote the check when the Germans blew up the Black Tom munitions depot in New York. So he became a sabotage agent. Uh, so um, Mexico produced interesting characters. Um, <laughs> um, so when he was in Chihuahua, he, um, um, what he actually did is interesting because um, most history books will tell you that he was a, um, a stringer for AP News, which is true. Um, he worked for AP News. Um, he went out to um, find properties for people. He had all these occupations that were not full-time and that didn't bind him to a certain place or a certain time. And that's actually a great thing for, for a spot, right? So you want to have a cover, but you don't want to be too close to anybody. And that's exactly the pattern you see there. Um, he um, travels around Chihuahua and Durango. Um, he doesn't, where he gets his money, you really can't find out. Um, there was a uh, German consul in uh, Chihuahua, his name was Otto Krip, and I did find a record where Sonnefeld recommended him for, uh, to the German government um, for a raise, so he became uh, a vice consul, um, and that, that meant uh, more money, and um, so Krip <coughs> is said to have paid a salary to Sonnefeld. Why would the German consul in Chihuahua pay a salary to some German miner? For information. So um, at this point, he was clearly engaged in collecting intelligence. And um, uh, very interesting, of course, 1908 is the time when uh, Madero published um, his book, um, No Re-Election, right? The, um, the big campaign to go against the dictator. Um, he, um, here it is, um, the Asociación Presidencial was published in 1908. He declares himself a candidate against the three ideas. Uh, we know the story later on. You know, he, he tries the revolution. It, um, you know, he doesn't have pretty much support. He comes to San Antonio. He writes the. Um, he gets arrested. Then comes to San Antonio. Writes the plan to San Antonio for the San Antonio here, and, um, and uh, this is what set off the revolution. Sommerfeld was very close to the Mateos. Uh, one of the records I found was that he gave writing lessons to Francisco Mateo. So, long for the revolution. And it's very interesting to know how did this man get so close to Madero when the revolution started. The German consul put him there. He was actually put there, and it makes a lot of sense. And Mexico was a big trading partner of Germany. And Mexico was the largest oil producer in the world, the Saudi Arabia of the time. Um, it was very important for Germany to know what will happen if the US is gone. Who will be the next president? Who will be the people in power? And um, there are other records where the Germans also had somebody very close to Carranza, Arnoldo Krumhel. So they were sending agents specifically to people that might play a role in whatever the future of Mexico is. And some of them was assigned to Madero. And that was a very smart assignment since he became president. Um, so the Madero Revolution starts. And uh, here you see a picture. It's one of the few pictures that exist of Felix Sommerfeld and his feelings right there. Um, after the battle of uh, Ciudad Juarez. Um, he had actually joined Orozco's troops, so he was uh, at um, uh, several battles leading up to the battle of Ciudad Juarez, and I found intelligence reports that he sent to the German consul that said who was going where and how they were doing and which railroads they were using and who was part of it and so forth. He was clearly collecting that intelligence at the time. 
Um, when the revolution succeeded in uh, May 1911, Sommerfeld becomes Madero's personal bodyguard. And uh, from that point on, they're inseparable. Um, wherever you see Madero, there will be Sommerfeld. Um, from this picture, you see, of course, uh, Francisco Madero, Ali Martin, a politician in El Paso, and Chris Haggerty, he's the AP News Chief of El Paso, and he is the cover for some of the other. Do you think that uh, Southern Field was responsible for uh, announcing uh, <coughs> some of the people going to the Washington side, like, oh, yeah. uh, like Pascolo Rosco? Oh, yeah. So this is a very obscure part of Pascolo Rosco. We had a talk about Pascolo Rosco, but there's still good, good calls. Uh, these people that, 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 that Orozco was going to get what I think? I will tell you that whole story because Sommerfeld defeated Orozco. It was really, it's an unbelievable okay. story. Right. And um, this happened in 1912, mm -hmm. right, when, the, when Orozco rose. And uh, before then, Sommerfeld was friendly with Orozco. So like I said, he traveled uh, to the battles. Mm -hmm. uh, he was reporting on them. Um, also in Sierra Juarez, when they, the battle of Sierra Juarez, he was in charge of um, telling the American uh, military commander in El Paso what was going on. Madero made him do that because the most, the biggest challenge to the, to the success of the revolution was to keep the Americans friendly and there were lots of bullets flying across the border um, and uh, several people were killed in El Paso. Um, they were sitting on railroad cars watching what's going on on the other side of the fence and they got popped off by a, by a bullet. Um, so that's not the smartest thing to do, I guess. But um, so Sommerfeld connects with Colonel Stieber, who was the American commander, and he's basically the um, the communication between Madero and the Americans uh, mm -hmm. was Sommerfeld. Did you have a question? I was going to say, no wonder Hollywood movies always paint the Germans as very nasty, aging, sinister, with scars and stuff. Yeah. You know, and that's what they were making this up. But I think that, as a matter of fact, what you said, there were a lot of German agents oh, yeah. in Mexico. But well, he doesn't have a scar. Yeah, I know, I know. But his boss, so in the German embassy in, in Mexico City was Peter Buchhausen was his name. He was the commercial attaché. He was actually running the agents after Kirk um, um, had to flee from, from Vida. And Buchhausen actually had it. It's called a Schmiss. So he had the, 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 the Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. German were very proud. Probably on the left cheek. Probably. I, yeah, was it the left cheek? Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, so here comes the Madero presidency, um, and um, here are some characters that are worth noting, and I'm just going to pull them all up for you. Um, I don't know if you know all of them. Um, Paul von Hintz, he was the German minister, he was the ambassador basically. Um, Mexico was, uh, they had only a minister, not an ambassador. But Paul von Hintz, um, very close to, the, um, to Emperor Wilhelm. Wilhelm sent him to Mexico, again, to showing you how important Mexico was to Germany. He was one of his top guys, Punk. Was he a naval officer? He was a naval officer and then changed careers to become a, um, to become a diplomat. And Pinze, um, there was a, um, right after the revolution was, uh, was finished and uh, Madero went into Mexico City. Well, the first, re the first thing that happened is Zapata rose up, right? So there were a bunch of shootouts. Zapata was supposed to disarm, but he didn't disarm. And the Madariscas fought the Zapatistas suddenly. And in this fight, a German-owned factory, was owned by a German company in Covadonga, was, um, was shot up. And um, two men and two women were killed, Germans. And the German ambassador was...